friends, you're listening to the USO LMT Massage Podcast. I'm Stephanie Rodriguez, your host. And today I've got some great guests with me, Sandy Fritz, Rebecca Brumfield, and Valerie Vonner. And today we're going to be talking about entry-level education and probably a whole bunch of other stuff that you might like. Let's introduce you to our guests. So Sandy, why don't you go ahead and start and tell people a little bit about you? So I've been in the massage world as a practitioner for over 40 years, close to 45, worked multiple settings, but always self-employed, except for a short stint when I was employed by a professional sport team. And so I've had a varied clientele. Um, I also own a massage school that's 35 years old. So I live it, um, textbooks write textbooks, which have to be revised every five years, which means I have to stay up to date. Um, and my family also owns a franchise. So we uh, are able to kind of see things from multiple directions. And I'm really vested in the future of massage therapy. That's why we love you, Sandy. I know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Rebecca, go ahead. Why don't you introduce yourself? I'm Rebecca. I am a Louisiana native, but I am a traveling therapist and the founder of Badass Body Workers. I definitely am a trailblazer in the industry and I want to help other people like learn that, learn the shit we didn't learn in school, you know, which I think is what we're talking about today. And just as we um, talked about before we did the intro, Stephanie, like old versus new, like things are not the same they were decades ago and they're not going to be same 15 years going forward. And there's so many multifacets of this industry in our career. So I think it's important that we do open up dialogue about these things because things are shifting, whether we like it or not. Mm -hmm. So myself, badass body workers, all of my colleagues, my friends, my mentees, I want everyone along for the ride. That way we can help the industry more move forward. Oh, and I've been doing this for like 14 years now. So a little bit younger, <laughs> but I love it. <laughs> love it. I have a lot to learn. We're always learning. Always. Absolutely. I know I am. And then how about Valerie? Why don't you tell a little bit about you? Um, I agree with everyone. Everything everybody just said this moment, we are always learning and changing and learning new things. Um, I have been doing this more than half my life, 52 years. And I teach, I run schools and I've written books. My main focus right now is to st try to help what's ever happening in the change and be available. And I only practice reflexology now. No more massage. But I'm very excited to be with these two women who are fired up and ready to go. <laughs> <laughs> nice. All right. Well, let's start talking about that. So what's the difference between then and now? Maybe Sandy and Val, you guys can talk about like, what was massage school like entry level education when you guys went? And then me and Rebecca can talk about what it was like when we went. <laughs> okay. Um, I went in 1970 to massage school and it was in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, and you went every day for a year, every single day, like nine to five. And starting with, there was no like semesters. You went and you studied and all of us were young. So then we went to work afterwards and came back the next morning and did it again. Um, there was no, I, I want to hurry up. We were there, we were invested. And clinic started probably two months into the program. So every Thursday was my day. So I remember it like it's yesterday. You went to class from nine to five, and then you were in clinic until 10 p. And that's the way it was. And we learned everything, everything. There was no specializations so that, you know, you had to go somewhere to learn deep tissue where you had to go somewhere else to it was all within my education we did not learn business we had to learn that on our own so you had to walk out and start educating people it was a year long it took a year and so the things that I didn't learn I had to learn on my own which I'm so happy now we don't have the students don't have to do that um, but I feel like I got a very strong education and the stress was always to continue to learn more and more and more until you became really good at what you did. That's, That's really me. interesting. No, yeah. no specializations. And that None. day sounds horribly long, nine to five and then clinic until 10 PM. Ugh. It was great. 
and I, and I worked in a club, you know, so I, I, I go to the club, eat dinner and, and work, but I was a kid. I was yeah. young. So, you know, we have that energy. Did you have a lot of young people in your class back then? Because I know now it's kind of like people in their thirties and forties. It kind of seems like those are, that's the age bracket kind of entering massage therapy. So back then, were there a lot more younger people? We were all young. Yes. Yeah. Interesting. We were all young. I think the children of our, ch- our children are the ones who are coming to school now. Yeah. <laughs> or the children of our children. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so there, I didn't go to school. Your characters. There was no school uh, in the in Michigan or in the immediate area. Um, so I'm self-taught and I'm guru taught and I'm workshop taught. And I started this in 1978. And so uh, our generation, you know, there was a carryover from the 60s. You know, I came of age in the 60s. And so did you, Mary, you know. <laughs> So there's that underpinning. Uh, So I I had to make my own concept of school. And Mm -hmm. not so much in the 70s, but starting uh, the late 70s, but starting in the 80s, there was just one guru after another that you chased. And that's how you learned. My cat is determined to be part of the (laughs) podcast. (laughs) It's okay. Cats are cute. Well, that's <laughs> yeah. the tail that you're seeing. So <laughs> after uh, just going out and starting, you know, just start. I had babies. You know, um, people kept asking me to start a school. I didn't know what I was doing. Um, so, but I, I knew I knew I could teach people to do stuff. There wasn't any licensing. There wasn't any regulation. You could just do what you wanted to do. Uh, there was no such thing really as employment, you know, it was, it was very different. And so I started in 1984, I started the development of a school and state licensed and accredited, went through an accrediting process and got really big change the curriculum around. If I throw her out, she will meow and scratch at the door. (laughs) (laughs) So eventually went back and got my bachelor's degree and master's degree because I was recruited to write textbooks. And I had to do that in order to fit into the academic framework of an academic publisher. Um, So you know, I've got a whole spectrum of beliefs about entry-level education. I tried to include everything too. And then I have actually, over the years, taught less and less and less and less in order for the students to be able to grasp competency on core fundamentals as opposed to having smatters and, you know, of little of this and little of that. Yep. So... Very different. You couldn't do it the way we we did it. You, especially, you couldn't do it the way I did it before. So that sounds pretty hard. Build your own school. <laughs> it was right. not self teaching is not easy because no, you know, from one guru to the other, all thinking that they were teaching something new, unique, special, you know, and spending. The, the amount of money you wouldn't even, I don't even want to think about. Um, and then eventually I got to the point where I went, man, they're all teaching the same thing. That's where yeah. that comes from is that idea of, you know, it's got all these different names, but it's not different. And so there was a lot of infighting and separation and all kinds of oh, stuff. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and it's it's different now. It's very different now, and it's better. In a lot of ways, it's much better. Doesn't mean it's perfect. There are things that we certainly can do, and I have a lot of opinions about that. Um, and but it's it's better for this generation, whether it feels like it or not. It is way better than it was for Mallory yes. and I. 
Yeah, you're probably right. Rebecca, how about you? Where did you go to school and what was that like compared to these guys? <laughs> Everyone always asks me why I got into this and there's there's really like no awesome story. Like I literally picked up my friend from work one day and her work happened to be in the same building as massage school. And I'm like, oh, massage is $20, cool. So I go and ask for a $20 massage and they told me it was student clinicals. I'm like, oh, that's interesting. So I looked at the curriculum and started the next day. I mean, it was, it wasn't like any grandeur, like, oh, I've always wanted to do this my whole life. No, it was, it was a moment of opportunity because we didn't even learn in high school that trade school was even an option. So whenever I discovered it, I was like, something just clicked. I was like, this is it. So my school was uh, in Louisiana. It's 500 hours for you to get your license to take your exam, but it's 750 for schooling. Um, Stephanie, most, most people that were in my class were probably in their we had everyone from, I was the youngest, youngest one at 18. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I think I turned 18, like three days after I started school. So I was definitely the baby. And then everyone else seemed to have used massage as a second career because they were already in healthcare of some sort or some mm -hmm. sort of caregiving profession. And, um, I was the only one that was there, like as the first, like first choice for a career. And I'm still here, which is great. But, um, yeah, Stephanie, most of my classmates, they were probably, they were probably in their like uh, 30s and early 40s, you know, switching careers and everything because they got burnt out from the nine to five and they wanted to do something that was more fulfilling. But yeah, they also, of course, we had um, we had high enrollments, but we had really high dropouts because, again, there's a lot of preconceived notions like, oh, I'm going to make all this money or, you know, I'm going to. Um, it's going to be easy and it's not. And I always say, Sandy, you'll like this. I always say, I only remember the names of like five muscles and four of them are quads. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know. Yeah. <laughs> and like, even right now, you know, I can maybe name like literally name like five or six muscles. I do a lot of intuitive work. Uh, I've been able to incorporate like some energy work and now I want to get into sound bowls and I do card readings and a little bit of uh, like coaching and mentoring. And it, it's so, it's such a multifaceted career, especially the way that I've curated my life and my career, because you know, my business and personal life are so incredibly intermeshed with each other. And I think a lot of people have like such a hardcore, you can't mix any of it. Oh, shut the fuck up. We could do whatever works yeah. for our life, we whatever can do. whatever's ethical for our clients, you know? So there's just so many ways that we can curate the most amazing career for ourselves, but we get caught up in the, the metrics and the, the vanity metrics and the numbers and, or in the case of a lot of my members is they get caught up in the um, scarcity mentality, the limiting beliefs, the blocks. I got into this to help yep. people not make money. And if I had a dollar for every time somebody fucking said that, I'd be rich. <laughs> but you can do both. And I want to, you know, I want to teach yeah. people that you can do both. And like y'all said earlier, we didn't, we didn't learn business in school. Our business class was a visual class, which was fun, but it was not business class. They didn't teach us anything. They told us, they told us to advertise on Craigslist and Yellow Pages. <laughs> so that was my my day in schooling, Stephanie. <laughs> oh, my, oh my goodness. goodness. <laughs> yeah. You know, business, business is a specialization in my mind. Yes. It's beyond entry level. I, I think constantly changing. And I think in entry level education, we need to provide a landscape of career options. We need to give a little bit of guidance. But if somebody wants to actually move into becoming a, a, a self employed, I mean, you can do that very simply with the DBA and solo practice and you know, all that kind of stuff. But if you want to move it forward beyond that, you really need to take business classes. Business is business is business. Mm -hmm. To pursue it through that venue and that avenue, and otherwise, you're you're, you're you've got anywhere from five hundred to seven hundred and fifty, basically. Some places a little more, some places a little less. And I don't care how education is described now. We're tied to the MBLEX exam. That's, we've got to make sure that we present content that prepares people to pass that exam. And I hate it. 
I hate the fact that we have to do that, but that's the way it is. And so there's only just so much you can do in that hour frame. And I don't want, I want massage to continue to be vocational education. It's, there's just no sense in beginning in entry level for people like you, Rebecca, to tie down to huge loans and have a, a two, three, four year academic pathway before you can even start. We've got, it's, there's such a beauty in staying within that vocational realm, uh, but there, but there's two sides to the coin. Yeah. <laughs> so can you talk a little bit more about the accreditation and, and what that means as far as like students having, um, how to have better discernment for choosing a school that they want to go to. Because as I just said, like there are all these uh, franchise model schools are popping up now and it's, it's great, but it's also, it's also weird. <laughs> I mean, yeah, weird. yeah. Like, it is weird. Yeah. I'm not, go, I, I'm not sure what you mean by a franchise model school. Are you talking about something like Cortiva? Uh, I'm not sure what, no, that's, does, like what house or like empower. Buy? Like, like Empower State Spa just opened up their own school. Oh, yes. That's I like heard about that. Yeah. Massage therapy kind of does the same. Like the school that I went to is no longer doing massage therapy because of low enrollment. Go figure. But they they offer like other trades and stuff. But whenever I was there, they let small business owners come in and talk to the students. I used to go to schools and talk to the students to try and get people uh, to know that my business was hiring once they're out. But eventually they told me that they don't want me to go there and volunteer teach. And, you know, unless I, you know, could guarantee like 20 people a job, they couldn't make space for me to come in and teach a free marketing class. And that just kind of baffled me. I'm like, what the fuck? That's so weird. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's weird. Everything is weird. So accreditation, weird. accreditation uh, primarily in the vocational sector for, pri for proprietary schools is for financial aid access. The federal government made accrediting bodies quasi gatekeepers. So the schools have to comply with all kinds of rules and regulations mm -hmm. and financials and all kinds of stuff in mm -hmm. order to assure that financial aid is going to be used appropriately. You don't have to be accredited. And the, the thought process is because you have to go through all of this stuff to be accredited, that that means a better school. Not so. That accreditation process is rotting from the inside, partly because of this quasi gatekeeper for financial aid. Sorry. And so uh, a school has to be state licensed. Yeah, uh, they have to go through that, uh, and so they answer to their state. Uh, after that, the external validation that I support for schools is Compta endorsed curriculum. At Compta, Commission on Massage Training and Accreditation is a fully fledged accrediting body. I saw that. <laughs> <laughs> I Selene? I Is there an eye roll? <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's such a tedious, I'm a small school by choice. You know, I don't take more than 24 students a year. That's my choice to do that. So for me to navigate all of the expenses for accreditation and managing all of the things that we have to do, it's prohibitive. <sighs> So uh, they finally came up with this curriculum endorsement, which means that you, for a smaller fee, um, Compta will endorse your, they'll look at your teaching staff and they'll look at your curriculum and yep. they'll, you know, they'll do that sort of thing. So that's, that's kind of the good housekeeping seal of approval. Uh, not necessarily accreditation. Valerie, you lived, you lived yep. that. <laughs> I've done Compta and I've done um, in, in the community college, which is very different. Um, in my own school that I ran, my model is probably just like yours. I have very, I don't run it anymore. Um, my it was $7,000. I didn't want to be accredited. I knew my curriculum was good and my students were going to learn and my teachers were qualified because I trained them. 
Mm -hmm. And so then working for other people and seeing and working in all these places, I've also worked recently with someone who got his curriculum, which you just said, the Compter uh, qualified accredited curriculum, which made it much better for him because he didn't want to take financial aid. Right. That was not his interest. Um, but he did want to have something, I think, like people are asking, what does it mean? Uh, small proprietary schools do not need it. And like you said, each state has their rules and you've got to pass those rules and they come and inspect and they want to look at everything and they need everybody's credentials. Mm -hmm. um, and it's through the Department of Education and the Division of Licensure. So yes. I think in a way, that's a much better way of looking at a school what does do they have to get licensed in their state yeah and i i was accredited with accsct oh. the of S i was accredited with them for 12 years but only so that i could i'm i'm a believer in vocational education right but mm -hmm. i'm also a strong believer in a pathway to an academic degree should you choose to want to go that direction. yes so I worked for years and years and years to get transfer credit to a university based on the vocational education. And now that's available through board certification. But before it was individual schools had to go through uh, a, 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 pro a process and you had to be accredited. And they wouldn't at that time, they wouldn't accept content. They would only accept uh, ACCSCT. And so I lived accreditation for years. <laughs> Uh, so, you know, um, but Rebecca, what you're bringing forward is confusion. Yes. One of our big problems at entry level is yes. confusion. <laughs> Well, that yeah. you know, I, I always say, like, don't take a CEU class just to collect a sheet of paper. Like nobody needs to take another online course from the insurance company's website. So you can uh, copy and paste a bunch of basic answers like no go take a class you're interested in uh, so many classes that i've taken post school because you know we're talking about accreditation and i'm over here like oh god um like i've taken classes that louisiana state board doesn't even approve that doesn't mean i can't uh do them it just means that i can't get my license for them so i've taken cannabis massage i've taken fijian i've taken uh, some intro to ashi i've taken like so many courses that louisiana does not recognize and I don't care because I'm a great therapist and I continue to get really like expose myself to these industry experts and taking all these amazing classes. So I can charge uh, enough to support my lifestyle and give the best yeah. to my clients. And when it comes to like learning, I mean, we don't, at the end of the day, we really, we don't learn anything in school. Hardly. We memorize some stuff to pass an exam and that exam is not even valid for somebody like me who wants to travel across the U.S. because there is no national licensing, real national licensing like right. travel does have at the moment. I think it's in progress, but I really want to see more therapists like take good CEUs that are going to propel their career forward, not take some, pardon my language, but another dumb fucking aromatherapy course online that you can just <laughs> copy and paste. Like we, we need to go after what our ideal clients could benefit the most from. And I see so many therapists that are just stuck, you know, and I, I find that like the schools have their own issues. And then when it comes to therapists taking CEUs, that's a whole other can of worms. Cause I used to travel and teach. I used to like do teaching assistant for cupping revolution and I had so much fun and I loved it. But even students who paid deposits wouldn't show up for their classes and were like, what the fuck? I couldn't keep traveling to teach people who weren't and really paid. And it's like these therapists every day reading stuff online. I really try not to think, th think this to myself. Mm -hmm. I'm convinced that massage therapists, tattoo artists, and hairstylists are the flakiest people I've ever met in my life. And we really need to have higher quality, like higher standards for ourselves, whether we work for someone else or whether we're solo practitioners who just really want to get ahead and stand out because this, I, I find, I tell people all the time, uh, so whenever COVID happened, everyone who had one foot out the door left in droves, which is a good thing for everyone else, for all the other therapists. But then we have like this two year lag because nobody was enrolling for school. 
So we have a severe supply and demand issue right now. Yes. And it still baffles me. Like as much as people have prioritized their health and wellness, or they're starting to therapists are still like, Oh my God, I have so many problems getting clients. I'm like, why I have a waiting list. It's like six months long. People are begging to get in every single day. Like there's no reason. I think, you know, that boils down again to the shit we never learned in school, you know? Yes. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I feel sad to hear that, you know, um, as, as an instructor and I'm Sandy, I'm, I'm sure you do too. Yeah. I mean, I, I felt that I wanted to make sure, and not only me, there's many of us that my students turned out knowing everything I could possibly give them at that time uh, and, and encourage them. Yes. To move on. If you want to go get that degree, that's what the community college is so great for. Many of mine went on to be nurses. Um, but what, you know, just always give them the hunger to learn more and get more and, but not walk out of school. I, I do feel sad, Rebecca, that you walked out of school feeling like you didn't learn. I actually, I had a really amazing teacher in massage school that she was the reason why I did not drop out. So if she wasn't there, I wouldn't be here right now about us oh, body workers being around. I wouldn't even know y'all. And it, it, it was, it was difficult because I missed a lot of school because my ex-husband at the time was in Mexico. Uh, he got supported. So I had to go back and forth between oh. the countries and I missed so many hours and I had so much money to pay back to like retake the classes. So while my school was supposed to be like eight or nine months, it ended up being like 10 to 12 for me because I had to remake the classes and I was going to drop out from all the missed classes. But my teacher, uh, who's still a good friend of mine and still a great mentor of mine, she owns a company called Muscle Medics. I love that name. She convinced me to stay in school and she's like, you're, you're going to rock this kid. Like you, you got the hustle in you. You got this. You're going to do good in this. <laughs> stay. <laughs> and I did. So I did have really good instructors, but of course things progress and transition and change so rapidly. Like we're on zoom right now, you know, mm -hmm. recording it, like, and then we're going to be scrolling through Instagram and TikTok later and things just, they transition so quickly and we have to learn how to uh, ride the waves it, because if we don't, we're going to, we're going to be underwater and yeah. I, I live in the South. I already live below sea level. We don't need to be under <laughs> any more water. You know, you, you're, you're yeah. so, you're so fresh and so accurate with what you're saying that um, the students that I have coming into the program now uh, and my, uh, even though I uh, would be considered a niche school or a boutique school or whatever you want to call it like that, I still don't fill my classes. I haven't for five years. And this was pre-COVID. So there was something going on before. Yes. And they want something different. They, they don't want to come to school for one. They won't or can't come to school five days a week. Two, they need flexibility. If I can't be flexible with the students and find multiple ways for them to complete the program, they're not, it's, it's not going to work for them. Right. Um, we have to make use of technology. I have students that sometimes will drive two hours to class. Do you know what that costs them in gas now? A lot. <laughs> you know, so I have been very supportive about pivoting as much as possible to a technology platform and using the hands-on, the, the class time for hands-on skill development uh, to support this younger generation or this career transition uh, student. And that's, it's, it's just way different. Well, I think we want better incentives now, you know, like uh, I have a few friends that are directors at schools and I tell them all the time. I'm like, hey, I have like this whole, uh, you know, start your first massage business checklist or whatever. Why don't you send it to all your students? You know, people need more practical advice. People or students are wanting not just to, to memorize all the muscles, but they want to know what type of. God, I hate social media sometimes as much as I use it, but they want to know what type of captions to put in their Instagram reels or, you know, what are some great CEU classes to take outside of school or what's a good follow-up plan for their customers or how to ask clients how to leave a review, like all these important business building things. Like they don't set people up for, I mean, they do set people up for success, but schools just haven't been teaching them, which is why you see people, people like me and other 
mentors and coaches and whatever just popping up all the time. I'm not the only one who sees that there's a severe need in this industry for change. And I think it's great that we are utilizing different forms of education and media in order to help the industry grow forward so quickly. You know, this is, it's going to be a long road, a really, really long road, I think, to get like national licensing to now, you know, that's pretty. That's good. That's, that's going to come faster than you think. I hope. Mm. Yeah. yeah, with the compact, I think it's yeah, going that to. Interstate compact is going to snowball really fast. Yeah. So. I, I know some loopholes, you know, and I'm not going to sit here and say, oh, I don't, you know, no, I, I know what the loopholes are. I will straight up tell the state boards, I know what the loopholes are. You can't stop me. So either you're going to work with me so I can get my license in your state or you can't do a goddamn thing about it. And that's really sad that I even I have to pull that card sometimes. So hopefully all of our boards and organizations are going to step up to the plate, too, because I mean, I'm not the only one that gets irked about um, having to educate clients about human trafficking and massage parlors. And it's just an, it doesn't have to be an uphill battle. I think the more we like create dialogue around stuff and the more we ask our colleagues and audience directly, what are your biggest pain points? What are you struggling the most with? What, like some of my favorite threads are, um, tell me the stuff you never learned in school or you wish you learned in school. And I love those threads. It's like, whoa, this is like free market research for people who yeah. do want to start classes. And it, it's, I think we're starting, starting to, um, like after COVID, I, everything is starting to become a more customized experience. And I'm starting to see more people pop up and offer like, uh, let's say sound bowl therapy with their programs or offer uh, courses on like emotional hygiene and, and like boundary setting with clients. And it's, it's just, it's so wonderful. Like regardless if they're CEUs or not, just seeing how many amazing trailblazers and industry leaders that we have really stepping up to the plate. And it's just it really warms my heart. It kind of annoys the shit out of me sometimes because people are so, so stuck in like what worked for them in the past. That's clearly not working anymore. And right. it, it's an up to a battle. It's a headache dealing with some of these people, but <laughs> I love it. And we're all doing this together. And that's how I think we're really going to be able to propel the in industry forward and have higher quality uh, education, you know, whether it be saying to your textbooks or, or Val, um, you know, some of the advice that you give people, Stephanie, you know, our podcast, like there's just so many ways for us to reach our audiences and just make this industry like what it really can be because it's truly blossoming, especially after COVID It yeah. completely shifted the entire industry. And it's, yeah. And what it's, Yes. We're talking about Rebecca's professional development. That is not, that, the same, that <laughs> that's not it. the same thing as CE. Uh, and that's another whole podcast. But I want to put forth an idea that one of the things that's relatively new on the market, and Valerie knows this as well, is it, it is potential for employment. Now, we tend to say the franchises, but it's the employment model uh, is much bigger than that. It's the healthcare and chiropractors and destination spas and gyms and, and moving towards the like idea. Of, treats. <laughs> you know, so employment was not, it wasn't even a thing and really a thing until 2002. So entry level students have the opportunity, graduates have the opportunity now to go into employment. They got a step yeah. thing. And if they choose their employers well, they can learn how to, how to run a successful business while they are employed. They can learn the ins and outs. They can figure yes. out what they like and what they don't like. So true. Uh, yeah. We didn't have that as a platform. No. I, tell I tell franchise owners when I talk to them or employers when I talk to them, you need to be prepared to be a mentor. You need to be prepared mm -hmm. for your current workers to move on from you if that is what they want to do. They are there to experience, hone their craft and experience own business, business ownership. And you have to just know that, that 
if you're going to run a successful business this way, the idea of capturing an employee and keeping them for 30 years, that's old thing. So you've got to be engaged in actively the idea of mentoring, preparing, professional development, and supporting that uh, person should they want to move on into their own business or however they want to do that. And you'd be surprised how many are doing that. It's just it's not advertised. You know, we don't see it. We hear the horror stories. We don't hear the good stuff that's going on in those employment sectors. I have a member in my community that I'm about to interview for my podcast next week, and she works for a resort spa, and she makes six figures a year after taxes because she fucking hustles, and they pay really well there. And I don't think massage therapists understand that whenever you're applying for a job, you're also interviewing the business. That's right. And I understand that. Yes. And I can actually, Stephanie, if you want, um, I can send you the, I have a link on interview questions for people to ask potential employers and vice versa, because small business owners, they also like, for me, when I started, it was just me. And then I, like I had another person help me out for couples massages and events and we kept getting books. I never planned on having an employee. It just kind of happened. So I was never prepared to have standard like operating procedures in place or um, like a staff handbook. I had to make that along the way. And one of my business mentors who is not in massage therapy once told me, your problem is hiring somebody to make the process, not follow the process. And I'm like, oh shit, you're right. That's why... That's why that situation didn't work out, but it's so important to like, also know that as a potential staff member, and I always use the term staff member because am I being misclassified? Oh my God. I don't want to go down that rabbit hole, but (laughs) that's a whole nother three podcasts. Yeah. (laughs) But whenever you're a potential staff member, you have the pick of like, you can cherry pick who you work for. You can ask questions. You can negotiate. Uh, in my case, like I don't work for people, I work with people. So I tend to fill in for some of my colleagues in the area that I'm staying in, whether they're recovering from a surgery or on vacation or just need some extra help. Or if I'm just in the area and, and they, you know, they need me to take overflow clients. It's been amazing. So I always say I work for people. Uh, I mean, uh, with people, not for people. And that's really unique as well. But what I do when I reach out to people is I send a video resume out along with like professional footage of what my like highlights from my massage routine. And I have a whole like video cover story, cover story, a whole video, like cover letter. And yeah, I am able, like I get hired immediately without having to do any sort of hands-on work, any sort of practical. They do not question anything in my resume. I have all the links to everything. And they've already hired me before I've even walked in the building. It's wild. So because of that, I am able to negotiate higher pay just because I had a video up on my resume. You know what? Isn't that crazy? Well, you're using media. Not really. No, that's That's awesome, Rebecca. I love it. You know, can I say what I'm hearing? You know, Rebecca, what you're saying is exactly what we we don't know how to do all that yet. So listening to you uh, again, I my my certification program now is only reflexology. It's a three hundred hour program. I do teach business, but you've just given me two tools mm-hmm. that I can now use um, because we do talk about social media and having a website and all that. But I, I don't use Instagram. So now I just learned something that I better hurry up and go learn it so that I can then work with my students who are coming in who can use that tool. What a beautiful tool. That was so exciting. Well, now, Valerie, you point out something really important in entry-level education. Most, (laughs) unfortunately, most of the private schools that are owned are owned by people that are my age or Mm -hmm. Or the vast majority of the teachers were trained prior to 2000 that are in the schools and they resist the change because they are afraid of the learning curve. Oh, we can all learn. (laughs) We can all learn. So a lot of it, a lot of the stuff that people are complaining about in schools is because the staff within the schools is afraid of the new technology. Yeah, I, 
I agree with you. I agree with you. That is so true. They don't want, they don't want laptops in the room. They don't want phones in the room. Who cares? Let them use them. If they don't hear what you have to say, that's their loss. Yeah, we, we did have laptops. Um, you know, we could bring in our laptop to take notes. I went to school in 2015, right? So like, I'm probably the most modern one here. Uh, but I went to a Steiner school, you know, as a corporate school, we had, you know, Mm -hmm. massage envy and elements and all these guys come in and talk to us like every other day. (laughs) Um, it was, you know, and you know, we're in Phoenix, right? So this is the home of massage envy. And so a lot of the people that worked at my school came from there. Also, mm-hmm. uh, you know, our education director was from there, uh, and then I think two other people on staff, uh, but the school was great. My teachers were great. I still keep in touch with a few of my teachers. You know, I love them. They're like super proud of me. It's pretty great to talk to them now and just be like, look what I did. You know what I mean? And that's awesome. And I love having that relationship, uh, with them. And I know that they're there. If I ever have a question or if I need anything, I've talked to them several times since, this all started, you know, they're still there for me as a mentor if I need it. But yeah, like we had, we had some younger students. Most of our students were probably like in their thirties though. Some were older than me. I think I was 30, 38 when I started or 39, when I started massage school. Um, and it was a second career for me, you know, kind of like you said, but we did have some people in there that were probably like in their late twenties or so. Um, we had a couple that traveled a long way. One guy actually came to take our, uh, to come to our school from, I think it was Iowa because they didn't really have much of an education process out there or any, you know, good schools he could go to. So he came all the way out and stayed and did all of his education here and then took it back to his state with him. So that was kind of cool. Um, but yeah, it was, it was a different, it was a different experience. It was fun. I had a lot, you know, a lot of fun throughout school, but Uh, I wish there had been some more technology. Um, I wish that it had been a lot of it seemed just kind of like, you know, we did have, Oh, the anatomy books that we had had, you know, CDs with them. That was nice. (laughs) Right. But we were streaming still, but they had like CDs where you could watch the videos, you know, about uh, all of the anatomy stuff. And I did do that at some point, I don't know. My laptop doesn't even have like a CD player in it now. Right. It's just not even a thing. (laughs) So it's not. Yeah. So things, things have changed and they definitely need to be uh, a little bit more up to date. So yeah. Now, Stephanie, we haven't even given you a chance to ask a question. We've just, that's right. I know you guys just been running your mouth, but that was kind of the whole point, right? (laughs) It is her podcast. What? (laughs) I said it is your podcast, so we should like. I am still here. It's all good. (laughs) I I do actually have a question, Steph, if you would allow me to have these ladies reflect on it. But I would love to where y'all see the industry heading. I, I mentioned about wanting the national, like, sort of reciprocity thing. That's what I am hoping big in this industry. But how about you ladies? Where do y'all see the industry heading now, especially post COVID and a lot of therapists like me going mobile and, you know, y'all school enrollments, like what are y'all's predictions for the industry? Well, um, I'm, I'm looking at that from multiple, multiple directions. Yes. Um, uh, having my foot in so many doors. So I see that same thing in the future. I think there is going to be like a spider web. It's going to be very much a, a um, uh, multi pathway where you really can choose what you want. Uh, but I do think that the newer generation is more engaged in what I, for lack of a better word, I'm calling the gig economy. They want multiple streams of income coming from multiple places and not always within the same realm. You know, they might want to do massage and this and then turn around and do, uh, (laughs) you know, I mean, it's all, all over the place. That being said, that being said, I, I think that the, uh, employment openings within the medical setting that so that would be under the supervision of physicians physical therapists chiropractors in acute care long-term care following the model of the va is going to increase and so 
that same type of personality that wants to have their fingers on a lot of different places, that's not going to be the place that that's going to work. So we're going to have to teach more traditional ideas around professionalism, um, how you interface within a hierarchical type of a, of a network. Uh, and I also see the entire spa industry, uh, franchise industry, all of that moving away from the luxury to well interdisciplinary wellness centers. Yes. Yeah. And the that will include integrated healthcare, and that's being supported by research. Uh, I actually out of the NIH right now. They're they're yeah. really taking a look at. There's enough research to support massage. We don't we don't need to prove it. What we need to do now, according to the NIH, is uh, show how it's going to be implemented and how it's gonna work in these various settings. So it's a pick and choose. Uh, it's, and it's not an either or, it's an and and both. I mean, you can go and do your, your massage in your mobile van and that sort of thing and whatever under the stars, which I think is fantastic and turn right around, put on your scrubs and go work at a cancer treatment center. But you got to know how to interface in those environments. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we're lucky here in Massachusetts because we have for so long pushed to have our people in the hospitals, in hospice, in all those places. And very, luckily and happily, it's been for a while. Uh, sometimes it doesn't work out, but for the most part, it does. Dana Faba has a huge amount of people that I and some other people have trained doing reflexology and massage in Dana Fava, which is one of the high biggest, you know, cancer hospitals in the world. Um, so I'd like, I agree with you. Absolutely. I think we, there are going to be people who aren't going to want to do that kind of work, but they're going to want to uh, be aware of it. And there are going to be other people that really need and want to do that. And that's the discipline. That's their lane. Um, and then what you said earlier, Rebecca, I think that there's many ways for art to be involved in because we are a science and an art. Yes. And so, you know, doing, using uh, energy work, which a lot of us do anyway, but using it and really including it and functional medicine is our friend at this point. And I think functional medicine is really going to use people like us in their offices. Yeah. Too. And the thing that came out of this international consortium on manual therapies, which is um, manual therapists from all over the globe, uh, massage therapists, osteopaths, I've mentioned that before, mm -hmm. is that um, people are, are wanting, it's a whole person care, whole centered care. And one of the emphases at um, NIH uh, in terms of the strategic plan is wellness, wellness, not, not as much pathology based treatment, but wellness, whole person, person centered care types of things. And that's gonna, as that unfolds over the next five years, that's going to be a very interesting concept of pathway. Uh, but yeah. but now we're talking about specialization and that's the next phase is that we need to come to a level of agreement about what entry level looks like and i th i think we have it we just don't want to admit it <laughs> <laughs> all right i think entry level is there uh it's just it's not and being they have like the two separate certifications for like spa therapists and then the medical therapist. So well, I, think Andrew, really? I don't think there should be a thing called spa therapist and medical therapist. Those mm -hmm. are environments. I, I might be, don't yeah. quote me on the exact okay. terms. No, I there know there you're, you're right on. You're right on. So entry level, entry level is always uh, the, the bottom line is enough to begin a career mm -hmm. out harming anybody public health, safety, and welfare. So that would be the wellness setting. And then if you want to work 
uh, if you want to specialize, specialization is where I think it's going to come come forward with. If you want to say you want to specialize and you really want to work in a medical setting, it's not the massage that changes. In fact, the, the more you work in a medical setting, the more foundational and basic the massage is. It's not about lear learning a lot of new stuff. It's learning about how to be in that environment, mm -hmm. how to adapt and respond yeah. to more and more fragile. Uh, yeah. In the sport and fitness world, which would be a specialization, now you now you've got performance based understanding that you need to have and and sport specific types of information and uh, how to work with athletic trainers and all that's a very interdisciplinary environment i lived i've lived that so very interdisciplinary but there is a level of knowledge expectation about knowing how to adapt foundational massage to help and not harm because they're, they're, they're actually a fragile population. Same with if you wanted to specialize in wellness for, for the older population. You know, Geriatric, yeah. You would need to know more about the natural process of aging so that you adapt your massage that way. So, uh, but it all goes back to how do I adapt the foundational skills not how do I find new things to do? Mm -hmm. Yes. Shiny object. Those are fun. Um, <laughs> yes. Pretty, I know like in our, in our realm, at least I know a lot with me online, a lot of my colleagues and members, they are now starting to do away with single appointments or at least surcharge the shit out of single appointments. And then the rest are like all programs. Like you have to sign like six or 12 month thing and it's all integrated. And I've seen a lot of my members move away from solo like single services and just do a complete wellness plan or a membership program. And I think that's great. Unfortunately, something like that could never be my model at the moment because I move around too much. Um, but I thought that was a really interesting observation that I made as far as like solo therapists go working for themselves who are making consistently like more than uh, $3,000 a month, you know, and yeah. uh, yeah. how about you, Stephanie, have you been seeing that a lot in in your network as well? I, yes. And I feel like, um, I feel like almost all solo therapists that I know have some sort of membership to their office. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, when I was in a uh, solo practice too, in 2015, um, and I did, okay. So Rebecca, you're going to love this. So my practice was called Shakti healing arts and every single treatment was based off like a certain chakra. I used like the Vedic love names it. for them and it was so awesome. And I loved all my stuff. Um, and so when I did that, I also would have like a series of treatments that they could get. And then later on, when I was working in a franchise, I was working with somebody who knew, um, structural integration and they were telling me about how they have like a, a 10, um, you know, it's 10 massages to get the treatment. And when somebody comes in to see them in their private practice, they would have uh, their first appointment and they would book all 10 treatments out. And by the end of the 10 sessions, they were done. So that's how his business worked. And I thought that was an amazing model. Like he was making all kinds of money. He had clients consistently. You didn't have to worry about rebooking. You're booking 10 sessions with one person at a time to get a specific result. And that was working really well. Yeah. yeah, I really here's 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 here is a truth. There aren't a lot of them, but here is one. Uh, you will make more money and have more of what you want your career to look like as a solo, self-employed practitioner. Absolutely true. Yeah. If if you. Uh, and develop a niche or a specialization yep. and fill that with retention clients. Yep. That's how to do it, um, which is what I have against the 10 sessions and you're done, you know, is that unless you get bored with those same people, but, uh, you know, a retention client base you, and it's just you and you're not, you know, you can control your overhead. You can go to their homes if you want. You've got so much freedom that way. As soon as you engage one other person, you've cluttered it up. Yep. 
I, I 150% agree at this point. In my, I've always worked for myself. I am a solo worker. Every once in a while, I foolishly like said, oh, oh, sure, you want to join? Never do that. And I've made <laughs> plenty of money, plenty it's, it's of money. That way, the do thing it that is, way or carefully choose right. a well-run employment situation for yourself. Yes, thriving. that they honor you. Yes. Yeah, and man. you have to honor yourself by charging enough money. So you've got to figure out how much do I want to make? How many people do I want to see? What do I want at the end of this month? You know, because that's what happens. People don't charge enough. That's the other oh, thing. My, my biggest pet peeve is when people ask on Facebook, what do I charge for a massage? And I'm just like, uh, head against keyboard, not again. But here's <laughs> another truth, Sandy. You'll like this is I always tell people, your clients do not give a shit what your overhead and expenses are. They don't care. They literally do not care. So stop okay. choosing what you think your clients will pay and start yeah. charging what you need in order to live the lifestyle that you need. And that yeah. depends from demographic to demographic yep. to demographic. It does. It does. You know, some- and it's not our business what they can afford. We set our business for us yep. and then they decide if they want us. Oh yeah. I had, uh, I had a client one time that's like, I can't afford your services. And this is back when I was charging $80 an hour, like 10 years ago or so. And I said, well, you have a pack of camels in your back pocket. So it's not that you can't afford me is that you choose to spend your money on cigarettes instead. So no, I'm not going to enable your bad habit by giving, by rewarding you with a discount. And he comes to me like every six to eight weeks, he still smokes. <laughs> I really don't give a chance. Yeah. I, you have to call people out sometimes and be like, why is it that you think you're entitled to a discount whenever they ask for discounts? I just They're put not. people by, why are you entitled? Oh, because I wrote you a Google review last week. Okay, girl, I'm going to hook you up. But and you not- have to have a passion for a demographic too. I, bl- I grew up it is. It is. I grew up blue collar. I grew up uh, the the place where I work right now. The average income is uh, in the demographics is forty thousand a year. Um, if I want to target that market, if that is my business decision, mm-hmm. then I've got to take a look at because ultimately we each client hires us, right? Yeah. Um, and we're, we're never self-employed. We're client employed. This comes from somebody who has been self-employed for. Oh, I love that term. Yeah. Right? Self, uh, client. But we're client employed and, de- and depending on, you know, not not, controlled. <laughs> what was that? Not client controlled boundaries. <laughs> oh, well, right. Absolutely, right. Absolutely. But at the same time, when I was, but at the same time, if I want to have a particular client, if that is what my business model is going to be, then I have to also function within what they will want to be involved with. Yes. Otherwise, your business plan isn't going to work. Yeah. So I worked with very high level professional athletes and the, if I said to them, I'm only going to see you between nine and six, they would go get fun somebody else because they cannot be available between those times. They have to be in practice. Now, can they pay me a premium for being there in the evening? Yes, they can. But I can't, you know, these are the kinds of things that I think we need to really be aware of. If I want to serve with massage a demographic of mechanics and waitresses and that sort of thing, then I can't charge $150 a session. They simply cannot afford that, even if they don't have a cigarette habit. (laughs) Right? Right. So. Each of us makes our decision on where we are going to find our level of satisfaction. Mm-hmm. And I personally get a tremendous amount of satisfaction out of helping a farmer that can barely pay their bills. And so we at the spa, at the franchise that we have, which is more of a blue collar model, uh, they can get a massage for 40 to $50. They can do that. And we still pay our therapists well. Um, 
But that's, you know, those are just, but those therapists also understand that. You know, so I, I, I do think we need a reality check around all of that. Totally. Uh, <laughs> so yeah. Yeah. there's the mama talking. <laughs> <laughs> I think what is so lovely about this amazing industry and career that we, we're in, ladies, is unlike other healthcare professionals, we can pick and choose our clients. We can cherry pick. And that's amazing. Mm-hmm. And like my mom was a nurse. She could not pick and choose her clients. She still help people. I still help people, but I, I get to literally like manifest my clients. And I always say like you, you accept the clients you think you deserve. So you have to like embody the type of energy that you want to receive as well. I, like you said, like helping farmers. I love that. Like, yeah, pay me in a bag of tomatoes. I'm cool. (laughs) Yeah. Equal exchange of energy, whatever it might be. Yes. And we have accepted tips in eggs. Yes. Uh, I feel like I might be okay with that. I love eggs. <laughs> oh, especially the price they are today. So a takeaway is, is that there's no right way to do this. And we, I think we need to monitor a little bit and step back from some of the rhetoric and some of the dogma that's out there is I need to be paid what I'm worth and I've got to do this, yeah. and this and that and all that other kind of stuff. This is a vocationally trained occupation. I love asking people, how do you value your worth? Like, can you tell me yeah, why I, yeah, your worth? That's so, a very like, good question. And yeah. it's not always money. Well, your worth isn't tied to your job, right? Like right. that's not what your worth is. Yeah. You're, no. You know, your worth is about like who you are as a human being. That's what I always tell people. Like it's not your worth is not tied to your job. You are, you know, what you do. I think the value of massage therapy is of unlimited worth, right? What we do is something that actually helps humanity. We can actually elevate the entire status of all the people in our world if we just touch them enough, right? And so, uh, yeah, what we do, it it doesn't have a value, right? No, we're in service. Yeah, we we are in service and that is where we go. And one of the things I like about the younger generation, which is something I've kind of always had in the background, is they've really embraced minimalism and living much more gently on the planet, which allows them a lot more economic flexibility. They they are making better decisions about living and transportation and all that kind of stuff and we all want to live in vans by the river now our parents were like you better get a job you're gonna be living in a van by the river and now people That's are what you i did that right. you're like okay <laughs> i did that cool. <laughs> it's, it's one i think you have to do i i do agree i have a 35 year old daughter who said to me mom i'm not going to be like you i'm nope. not going to work my whole life no nope. i'm gonna do many things. And I said, go for it. Be you, do you, you know, um, because it's not true. You don't work and then have time to retire and do things. So that was a big lie. <laughs> no, you need to do that while you're still young. You need to be able exactly. to do things. <laughs> I did. Thank goodness. Thank, I did. I, I did everything I ever wanted to do. But good. Th- then I had kids. Then I had kids. I, my second child I had when I was 38, when you were going to massage school. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Now, Sandy, I know that you're like, we even connected just because of your future, your stance on the future of massage therapy. And I was like, I want to know what Sandy's thinking. This is really cool. I need to talk to her. And so what are you doing in your school that you think differentiates uh, maybe other schools, um, you know, where you're really where you're really starting to look at what the future is going to be like for these students. Is there anything that stands out, some advice that you could give somebody to kind of help them work that out and how they might teach future therapists? I'm not teaching modalities. I'm teaching uh, uh, massage is a manual approach. It's a force-based application. It's a push or a pull. The lang- and that's, that language is going to happen to us whether we like it or not. And you can call it all the different names. It's not going to matter. It's going to happen anyway. So I teach them what the, 
I teach them first ergonomics and body mechanics, which is essential. And there's a lot of BS out there about that. Mm-hmm. Uh, fortunately, the Massage Therapy Foundation is actually supporting a for real ergonomic study on that. that yes. Is, it's going to help. Okay. I teach them that they are solving a, that they're there to achieve an outcome for a client. Uh, And there are lots of different ways for that to happen. Um, And that they need to work from an evidence informed type practice these days. And if it's not, if it isn't in that realm, don't throw it away, but just differentiate it. So this there's, relaxation and well-being which is huge huge the whole well-being thing is probably the single biggest thing that's coming forward Mm -hmm. stress management pain management which is the next big thing or the uh, current another current big thing and then mobility which has got the least evidence of all um and how are they going to develop a unique adaptation of the basic skills so that they can uniquely engage with each client. That's what I'm doing. I do not have, I do not have a two day deep tissue class. There's no such thing as deep tissue. Anyway, (laughs) I don't teach a uh, two day uh, Thai class, which is not Thai massage anyway, it's cultural appropriation and you can't learn anything like that in two days. That that's a discipline and a study that would happen over and above that. Mm -hmm. Um, I teach critical thinking, which is messy and it's hard and it, but it's, it's, you got to learn to make it up as you go. Yeah. Every other school around me is teaching a, a static curriculum that's divided up into modality pieces. Interesting. How about yours, Valerie? What is uh, going on there? And you're in New York, right? No, I'm in Massachusetts. Massachusetts. Okay. I yeah. knew you were up there somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> so I've uh, worked in many different ones. Um, but like I said, now I teach um, a 300 hour reflexology program. So I could use that as the model. I, everything that you were just talking about, well, actually I teach professionals. So they need to have already gone through the basic training of something professionally. Um, be it Reiki, be it massage, be it cosmetology, be, you know, nursing, whatever it is. Um, And we talk about a few things. In the beginning, I talk about what is the technique and how does it happen and what are we going to do? And I immediately start with hands-on. I have now started to do all the didactic stuff on Zoom. Yeah. And everything... um, because nobody, nobody can tell me what to do with reflexology. There is no, like, you have to do it this way. So I'm doing it uh, the way that I find at this point in time is the best for the student and for me. And um, the Zoom classes, I also have people that come in and teach kinesiology as it pertains to reflexology. I teach anatomy and phys because they need to understand when they're working on the people's feet, they're also working on their whole entire body. So that's the way I teach a lot of touching. I'm a touch teacher. Yeah. Whether I have 50 people in the class or five people in the class. Yeah. My students start out with hands on the very first day. Yeah. It's important. They got to touch. And um, I think we, agree, we definitely agree. Our philosophy is, you know, we want them to be the best they can be. They can be, be please be better than me. Please be better than me. And the other, do more. Yeah. The other thing we've got to have, and I have it, and I'm proud of that, is flexibility. Yeah. Flexibility in education. And I fight some of the rules and regulations that I am held to in order to provide that flexibility. You know, and I have raging dyslexia. I am not, you mentioned ADHD. You know, everybody everybody is going to find their way to the end result, which is just another beginning, right? They're going to find their way to that based on what their, their strengths are. You know, we have to work to our strengths and we have to own our weaknesses. We all, (laughs) 
you know, and, and again, that's where an employer, not everybody can do what you do, Rebecca. And not that everybody can do what you do, Sandy. I sure as fuck am not going to be writing textbooks. <laughs> you know, it's not everybody's cut out to be self-employed. They are not. Right. You know, I, I the other demographic I get a lot of of people is that are using massage as a retirement career. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I had a lot of those in school with me. And they don't yep. want to do their own business. They don't want that. Nope. Um, so, uh, but they, they want to, they want to serve, they want a passion, they want to supplement their income. They want those. This is one of the most multifaceted and multi-passionate careers I've ever come across. And it's like people who are counselors because they wanted to get into school to study psychology, to understand themselves. I find that almost all body workers get into this to help themselves or obviously somebody that they know, but they know that they're going to be healers or facilitator of healers, whichever term people prefer to use, but that involves a lot of self-healing. And I think innately, we're all kind of like searching for that, you know, inner balance and just making the world a better place. And there's so many different ways to do that and so many different outlets. And it's, I've done a lot of different outlets, like Stephanie, I'm sure you've transitioned before. Like, yes, I'm not really in the self-employment phase. I'm in the self trying to figure what the fuck out. (laughs) <laughs> like trying to figure all this out. It's so, it's so interesting because now we have so many different opportunities. Like five years ago, we didn't have, I do not use soothe and zeal and economy gig apps for massage therapy, but that was never an option. Hey, so people can like, I think test the waters a little bit more because there's more options for us to kind of dip our toes in to chiropractic and see if we don't like it. So we went to spa One girl calls herself uh, the six-figure massage therapist I briefly mentioned earlier who works at a resort. She calls herself a structural Swedish therapist. My friend in Seattle, where I go help out, she calls herself a massage artist. And one time I was snarky at a a party with a bunch of engineers and I called myself a muscle manipulation engineer. (laughs) That's That's perfect. We can call (laughs) ourselves so many things. We're all definitely badass for sure, but we're all, we're all loving. We're all healers. We all just want to help. And I think that's one thing that no matter how triggered people can get or how much their limiting beliefs hold them back sometimes innately, we're all in this career to like make an impact on something. And I choose to go after a huge impact. Some people choose to be a little bit more, um, just, you know, on a one person basis, like so many people want to do like group stuff, you know, like it's just, it's, it's so amazing. I'm so grateful to like, even be in this space with, with you lovely ladies and Sandy, I've been following you for years, totally (laughs) in the background that I'm thinking like, (laughs) She's too structured to to ever like me, you know. So I've never oh, reached out. No, oh, no, no, she didn't know you. <laughs> I could never compete with her post. You say you have dyslexia. I have like anatomy dyslexia. <laughs> Number <laughs> like, spiritual dyslexia. Like we're we're all a little. We're we're all a little fucked up somewhere, but you know what? And that's okay. And yeah. And careers evolve. They do. And there's yep. nothing wrong with that. I mean, I uh, I could list five, ten different renditions of how my career has unfolded, and each of those happened because I was willing to start, <laughs> not necessarily knowing everything I would have, <laughs> but confident that I could learn it. I could figure it out on the way. Um, and I embraced opportunities. You know, I was a single mother in the 80s and the 90s. I had to work. Me too. I had to have enough income so that I could keep track of my three kids. Are your kids in uh, in our world as well, or what do they do? My and daughter, my daughter, happen. actually, she comes up, she was in the army, and now she actually runs the school in the spa. Yeah. 
my son, my youngest son, uh, is writing textbooks with me. He has uh, been uh, a massage therapist now for 15 years. And his last, he's teaching now for me primarily. Um, but he was with the Detroit Pistons as their hired full time massage therapist for over 10 years. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. So, Stephanie, right? You know, so the the issue is, is that whether you're making an impact on one person in that room by yourself, and whether you're charging two hundred dollars, or seventy five dollars, or sixty dollars, or whether you have a national voice. It's all of equal value. Mm -hmm. Or bartering for tomatoes. Yes. (laughs) And I think one of the problems we've got, be it education or anything else, is that we are, we we have a problem with professional identity. And that we've got some people that are saying you have to make the six figures. Uh, or don't accept gratuities or, or, and I love gratuities, you know, you know, so I think, I think we've got to embrace the diversity, but I also think we need to have a, a kernel of professional identity that we springboard off of. Yeah. And, And that goes all the way back to our original question, which was entry level education which I do not think as a rule, we're doing very well. I think I'm doing it terrific. I do too. And I think I did it terrific, but I agree with you. Can we just like clone all of us and just blah, 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 just, you know, make that ripple effect as big as we can. Um, We've got two textbooks now, two major textbook lines that are used in the massage community. Uh, and a lot of that has to do with publishers dropping it because enrollment went down. And both of us are work for the same publisher, um, but we don't agree. Yes. And so I, I saw a stat the other day, ladies, that said each person has the ability to impact 80,000 people in their lives. Because if you impact just three people, right. those three people impact three people. And yeah. It just keeps moving forward. And um, (laughs) I mentioned earlier, I have a little ADHD, so I always keep a card deck on me. And I just shuffled it and pulled a random one. And this one's for you, Sandy, uh, for all of us. But it says speak truth. Oh. Is it again? Ace of Swords. Speak truth. Oh, speak truth. Oops. Yeah. my glasses on. I thought it was the Ace of Swords. Those are nice (laughs) cards. What kind of deck is that, Rebecca? Thank you. It's by a brand called Threads of Fate. And I received it um, from a member of mine on my birthday. So that was the coolest birthday present I've ever gotten. And every time I pull a card, it always seems to be on point. But Sandy, you're just dropping like so many truth bombs right now. (laughs) And I know Stephanie and I are pretty outspoken as well. And Valerie, you're definitely... I'm just the laid back one. Yeah, before we wrap up, Rebecca, I wanted to kind of, I wanted you to kind of speak to some of the, some of the technology and the stuff that you're using to teach through badass body workers, because literally like even coming out of a school, just coming to a massage group that is actually helping you with a specific thing. So like you ran, you started this group, you're like, I'm going to help people in business and help these women grow. And it's amazing what you have done. I am, I've been following you for a long time. Um, and I am so impressed with your programs and how you've done everything. Um, but I know like we were talking the other day about clubhouse, right? Clubhouse is a new technology that people are using. A lot of people in my group that I have, I have a lot of like older therapists in my group that have been around for quite a while. And they're like, nah, I don't want to do clubhouse. Like, eh." you know, but your group seems to love it. I've seen other groups. They're using it a lot. Right. So what kind of technologies are we looking at for like now and in the near future that we can use to help educate more good lord um (laughs) so i'll start with clubhouse because i love it because right now we're all on zoom and y'all look amazing but 
Clubhouse is not a video platform. So you could literally be walking your dog or driving and it's like walking into a coffee shop and talking with your friends in person. It's interactive. Uh, people often get more vulnerable when it's just audio because yes. they speak more and they don't have to quote unquote, look at other people. Um, yeah. The platform itself, in my opinion, is really good for uh, the best, one of the best platforms for repurposing content because you can download your replays and you can run it through a website or software to cut, you know, 15, 20 second segments out of it as teasers. Um, you know, all of my talks I'm going to be putting in my membership vault so people can access it later. And it's more of a spoken dialogue because so much gets lost between the lines, like mm -hmm. and, and behind a screen. So whenever you're speaking with somebody, tone of voice is everything. And I, you know, I just love the platform so much. And myself, I'm an audio learner. I will probably not choose to be a public speaker because I don't like being on stage in front of people. And oddly enough, I'm a, I say I'm a person person, not a people person. I like small group. Mm -hmm. I like to be the face of something, but kind of like be a fly on the wall and on the sidelines. And that requires being able to build community with people, mm -hmm. like your clients or colleagues, uh, understanding people's patterns and behaviors, um, understanding different perspectives. And that, that takes a lot of mental energy and it's very exhausting. Um, and it takes a lot of humility. Anybody who is in our industry, it takes a lot of humility and a lot of vulnerability and a lot of fuck ups to really be able to teach. And some people just choose to tell everybody how they screwed up. So everyone else can avoid taking out the wrong type of loan or not having a signed yeah. contract with a yeah. potential business partner. Like I have fucked up a lot. And, and I, I love, uh, systems and automation. I love, um, like now, Stephanie, I I've had badass body workers for 10 years. I don't, 10 years for seven years. My God, sorry. I don't know why I said 10, but I have preached the same values that I hold for myself for that long that I don't even have to answer questions in the threads anymore, hardly because everyone else does it for me because we can teach people. We can teach old dogs, new tricks. We can train people to Amen. Have discernment on how they're absorbing information on how to not get stuck in the overwhelming bright, shiny object. So we can choose yes. a system or a mentor or a coach or a software or whatever that will work for our lifestyle and business. And I've kind of like almost branded myself as like a concierge of sorts. I love getting to know people of their, what they're doing, what works for them. You know, like the zoom video, we can download it and have the audio stripped and make clip it's out of it. You know, we can screenshot it and show off that we've been having this amazing conversation with each other, like put on a podcast. There's so many things that you could do with just one system. And if you don't know how to use something, literally just get on YouTube shit. You can YouTube anything. <laughs> yeah. I, I found that, uh, <laughs> like Instagram for my, for my hands-on business does not work for badass body workers, it's great. Facebook for badass body workers is amazing. But for my brick and mortar, my brick and mortar business, my uh, mobile business, what works is getting my ass off to local events. Yeah. So not so much as like technology as it is just having clarity on who you want to serve in that moment in that chapter of your life. Because Sandy, like, you can be a multifaceted therapist, but you're not going to market to your athletes the same way you would a, a pregnant woman. No, that's right. Like you can't use the same language that so we have to, no. we really have to develop um, better people skills and better yeah. discern things and just be open to learning and not be intimidated by new processes or new technology because at yeah. the end of the day, like it takes, if I, if I wanted to learn a new system or something, I just block out a couple of hours and I just watch a shit ton of YouTube videos on it or listen to a podcast. And as far as content creation too, uh, like people are posting quotes from Gandhi and Oprah and those are great. You know, we've all seen them, 
but I post quotes from the current podcast that I'm listening to or the conversations that we're having right now. Like I wrote down a couple of things that you ladies have said that I might turn into graphics because that's what's relevant and that's what's happening now. It's not some regurgitated shit that somebody else has done. Like, I, you know, I'm posting what is going to make an, really make an impact in that moment. And then of course you tag those podcasters and bloop, 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 bloop. You're in their audience now, so I have to talk about this all day, but I'm gonna like stop. (laughs) Yes, I have to share with this. This has to do with um, the ICMT, the International Consortium of Manual Therapies. They were gonna do the traditional uh, on-site location uh, at in Arizona, but for a variety of reasons, it pivoted, and they found a platform called Gather Town. I love it. It's so cute. was so cool. Gather town. That sounds adorable. It sounds I like think we're going to, I'm going to try to use it for our conference coming up in September. It, it's it's this, you make yourself your little icon and you wander around and everything is in real time. And is um, a, you put on VR headsets too. <laughs> no, Rebecca, I do you remember the game dig Doug? You ever played that arcade game dig Doug? No, like, I don't. Okay, so there's this arcane game. It's called Dig Dug. If you're my age, you'll probably know. If you're not, you know. Anyways, but you're like a little character and you just like dig holes in the ground and it's just like the ground around you and a little sky and it's so cute, but just the way that it was set up, that's what it reminded me of, or I guess modern day, like Minecraft, right? Oh, yeah. We had breakout rooms. We had a park. We had a beautiful poster session. And some of our biggest naysayers who were all older um said i i'm convinced i did not miss any level of engagement hmm. by using this platform i'm gonna look at it it was so easy all you had to do was press arrow key or an x you know and it took a little eye hand coordination but that's an example of do you know how much people save by not having to go to a, yes. or, you know, get exposed to who knows who, get shot, <laughs> these right? days, drive, to spend money for this, you know, and massage therapist, you know, we can, if we leave our, our work, you know, we lose money. And so they, they did it in four and five hour snippets and it was spread over 30 days and it just broke all the rules related to how a conference should come down. And it was fantastic. I love, I love breaking the mold. That's my favorite thing to do, you know, and another, uh, app that I love is insight timer because instead of doing Facebook, yeah, yeah, you can see who's going live on a meditation and take a workshop on, anxiety or a 10 day uh, self healing journey. There's really so many different types of content on this platform and it's just all loving. None of it's like, you don't have a bunch of ads in your face. You don't have a bunch of like keyboard warriors. You know, you can wake up and do a 15 minute yoga session cause you don't want to be in traffic again. It's just amazing. And if we really just use technology and social media to make a positive ripple effect and to help people rather than using it to detract from our lives. Yeah. We definitely expedite everything going forward for sure. But you just, you just got to dip your toes into different things and try it. If it doesn't light you up, don't do it. If it's not fun, if something's not fun, don't do it. That's why I don't do psychology. It's so boring, Valerie. I laughed. I I thought you probably never had the real deal. (laughs) (laughs) I had to laugh until I was thought I was going to split. One of our really, really high-level researchers, uh, when he built his avatar, he somehow got himself a purple ponytail, and he couldn't figure out how to get rid of that purple ponytail. Well, I think so that would be great. Really high level person <laughs> the whole time I'm running around that platform with a purple ponytail. I just thought it was terrific. <laughs> that is, that's awesome. I love that. <laughs> it makes things much less intimidating that way. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> All right. Well, I'm about, um, I think it was, I think that was a great conversation. I'm going to go ahead and try to wrap this up for us. So um, why don't you guys each just go around and let people know how to find you. If you want to drop an email address, you want to drop a group, you want to drop whatever you want. Uh, let us let people know how they can kind of get in touch with you and what you might want to offer. So Sandy, you can go first. Uh, well, there's the school and all that, but I'm uh, most active on Facebook, I think, as far as easily getting a hold of me. And so, you know, you can message me or whatever. I'm I'm committed to responding to those kinds of interfaces. Yes, don't be scared to message Sandy. She's so awesome and lovely and wonderful. So that was my experience. I was nervous, but she talked to me and I was like, she's the greatest person ever. I love her. <laughs> so yeah, do it, do it. Don't be intimidated or scared of these people. They're amazing. All right, and Valerie, how about you? Um, I guess Facebook, you know, Valerie Wanner, B-O-N-E-R. And um, um, Messenger always makes me nuts, but if you want to reach me out, out to me on Messenger and just say, hey, let's have a chat, that's fine. Don't post pictures or anything, because I got whatever it was a few years ago from Messenger. Someone sent me a picture and I opened it and that was the end of that. So. I do use it, but it's more, if, if we're going to have a conversation, that's great. Cause I don't want to have a conversation on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> that's too public. <laughs> Got it. And Rebecca, how can people find you? Send me a smoke signal because I'll be out in the woods. Okay. <laughs> I do a lot, but uh, you can of course find me on Facebook, Instagram, clubhouse, insight timer and under badass body workers. And I'm actually about to uh, transition from having everything on Facebook to my own platform and website because I don't mm. want men owning everything, which is one huge thing business owners need to be aware of mm. is to have your own home, your own digital home off of social media as important as it is. So yeah. I'll have my own website and forum where everyone can log in whenever they do need a social media break which I guess is still being online, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. We have that with USOLMT too. We have a full on private platform for people to come. All right, everybody. That's a wrap. Sandy, Rebecca, Valerie, thank you so much for coming on the show. This is Stephanie with the USO LMT Massage Podcast. USO LMT is a nonprofit massage association based in Arizona for students, professionals, and employers in our industry who want to drive advancement for the future of our profession. Join us at www.usolmt.com. Thanks for listening, and we'll talk to you next time. <laughs>